Hello everybody, James here. It's Ask Dutch Anything number 27. It is the episode where you get to ask Dutch Mantel anything. Uh, if you want to, I'm just sorry, I'm just looking at Dutch's camera here with the University of Dutch caps floating in my face. You can get those at Dutch Mantel, sorry, Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. Similar to the diplomas for the University of Dutch that you can order through Dutch as well. There is an auction potentially going on for that very figure that you can see on your screen if this is not an audio version of the podcast you're listening to. That is a, um, it's not in production, it's a pre-production, it's just an idea, it's a concept of a Dutch Mantel figure. And also the books behind him as well, The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. They are for sale on Amazon as well as through Dirty Dutch Mantel, 2Ls at gmail.com, signed versions. Sort out your, I'm looking at a piece of paper. That's a concept, that's not what you would get in the mail. <laughs> Hang That's on. a concept. Hang yeah. on, one sec. I've just my mortgage advisor is ringing me. One second. Sorry. All right. Yeah, I had to get rid of my mortgage advisor then. Okay. So the concepts of this podcast, if you've never heard of it before, but I'm sure you have. Ask Dutch anything is ask Dutch anything, and to ask Dutch anything, you write two questions for Dutch at gmail.com and submit your poses to the Dutchman. And the best ones gets in the script as well. And once again, Dutch is holding a piece of paper with an idea of a diploma. But the one you actually get is way, way nicer with gold trim and stamps and everything. Why are you showing that one anyway? You've have you not got like the proper one? Oh, I just, I just, I just yeah, I just grabbed it. That's just a oh template. Well, anyway, don't worry. They're really the ones that you will be buying are really, really nice. Um, rather than just like a template for the um, for the page. Anyway, here's the first question. Steve Vendetta has written in and said, James Dutch, I hope this message finds you well. Dutch, I'm glad you've recovered from your hospital ordeal. You seem like you're back to normal. My question for Dutch is, who was more hairy in their prime? You, Miguel Perez, or Gamma Singh? Of course, you edge them out when it comes to head hair, since they weren't naturally as gifted as you, follically challenged or otherwise, I guess. But in terms of body hair, it seems that three of you had an unpublicised rivalry going (laughs) during your in-ring careers. I think he's asking, who do you think was the hairiest wrestler ever out of those three and whoever else? Okay, what were the other two? Miguel uh, Perez. Yeah, Miguel Perez. And who? And Gamma Singh. I'd give it to Miguel Perez. He was a hairy son of a gun. He's not hairy me. But he is a hairy bastard. No. He is a hairy bastard. See, what I have to do, but his hair is different than mine. His Mine just grows kind of long and wild, and, you know, and his kind of is more close. Like permed. Yeah, he's kind of, but I think that, I got him beat out, I think, but but what I have to do, and I've never said anything like this in public, sometimes I have to clip my hair on my chest and back because it actually kind of hurts sometimes, especially when it gets, I don't know, it just, and I clip it, and... Lawler used to do that too. Lawler showed me. Lawler's hairy. Yeah, here's the thing though. He, is he had electrolysis or something because, like, at one point his shoulders didn't weren't hairy anymore. He he just probably shaved it because he's. Well, I don't shave it. I clip it. One time I tried nair. Don't try that crap. <laughs> You'll be, yeah, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it starts burning and itching and what the hell, you're back in the shower again. So, but I, I did, I did, I did try it. So, uh, but I, I, I'll have to give it, I, I will, I will agree with this. What's his name? Oh, the guy who asked the question. He was called yes. Steve Vendetta. Vendetta. That's a good name. I like that. Steve, I'm going to have to give it to Miguel too. I think he's a little bit hairier than I am. Okay, who's the hairiest of all time, would you say, wrestler-wise? I'm trying to think of other names. Uh, you know, George Steele is pretty damn hairy. Mm. He's hairy. Uh, the French Angel was very hairy. And I think he was. But that's the only ones I could. Uh, most of the other guys, they, you know, unless it grows a, a lot, they, they just keep it clipped. I'm, I'm going to give you a list of found. The Sportster, number 10, Wild Bill Curry, or Bull Curry, shouldn't it be? Uh, yeah. Uh, hell, his eyebrows would be more than my hair. Yeah. Yeah. 
Them some eyebrows that just won't quit. Yeah, I see it. And some uh, George the Animal Steel. Yep. That was pretty incredible. Giant haystacks. But I don't think he counts. He, he doesn't have the arm hair of the others. Um, Killian Dane. He was a hairy son of a gun. NXT. Big John Stud. I don't think so. Uh, Coffee Brothers. No. Elias. No. Seth Rollins. No. No. What? I don't even Harriest. know. What I don't even know what they're talking. This is the worst list I've ever seen. Oh, and Terrible Would Ted go- the Wrestling Bear is number one. Oh, yeah, he, he would probably win. But who put that together? Oh, Seth Rollins. That's that might be the worst. Sports just comes out with some crappy list, and, and that is one of the worst. And I'm not ever. included in there. No, unbelievably. That's stupid. That's uh, that, unbelievable. Uh, okay, Cult of Whatever. I'm just going to have a look at this. The hairiest wrestler in WWE. Let's see what they say. Nope, they're not even going to give me a name. Right, okay. We need to come up with a list of the hairiest wrestlers ever. And you have to be like the king in your hairy throne. <laughs> with a hairy <laughs> crown on. Uh, I will, yeah. We'll we figure... need to come up with one. <clears throat> we'll, f- we'll figure that out for another time. Uh, next question. Troy from Kentucky. I'm sure Dutch is busy getting better and reminiscing about his long career in catering. But was wondering if he ever was around <laughs> Damien Demento enough to tell me what the hell is wrong with him. If you've got a few minutes and have been wondering what crazy looks like when it hits the uh, hits record and starts talk uh, talking, take a look at it. Not very many videos, but enough to figure out that his cornbread isn't done in the middle. So, have you ever been on a show with Damien Demento? He briefly Never in met WWF. Him. Never met him. And after seeing this. I don't want to meet him. It's a long so, video, this one, so I'm not going to play it. Just, so. show, just show a part of it. Do you want me to show a part of it? Okay, bear with me one minute. Right, okay, with that. Right, where do you want me to start? That they inducted In, anywhere. the Bushwhackers into the uh, WWE Hall of Fame. Nice guys, good guys. Funny, right? You know, ha-ha. The thing is, when you have a Hall of Fame, right, it means that you had an influence on the on the industry, on the business. It wasn't because, you know, you had a long career, you were nice, or you were funny, or maybe you did favors. It was because you had an influence. And without question, the character that I created had an influence. On what? I could see it. When I'm uh, That's it. when I when I'm channel surfing. <laughs> Mm. Is this what some the hell? Mm. I've never heard. I've heard the name, but I don't know if Damien Demento had an influence on the business. No, maybe he had an influence I, on jobbers because he lost all the time and then left. And then he was saying the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's not for people who had an influence. It's had for people who drew money. <laughs> I mean, if if you're gonna, I don't know. I've never heard the guy. I've heard the name. I don't know this guy, but he was sitting around doing uh, his own video, by the way, uh, bored probably, and amongst other things, and saying that he should be in the Hall of Fame, I guess. I think he he's, he's butthurt that nobody remembers Damien Demento. I don't ever remember anybody saying they copied da- Damien Demento. Hmm. I don't know this. But anyway, folks, that's the type of stuff we get in the Ask Dutch Anything here. I'm having a look on his matches. He was in WWF for less than a year. He always lost. I think he may have been, I think his claim to fame is he was in the first Raw. Or he may have even been the main event of the first Raw. I'm having a look. He um, stopped wrestling for the WWF in September 93. He started, he barely did any wrestling apart from WWF. Um... So there you go, year. Just under a year he wrestled. And he also had a weird way of I don't know if you know what he looked like in the time. He had like a black giant cape sort of thing. Had a weird haircut dyed black but bald on top. But mm-hmm. he seemed to also move around the ring like he'd shit himself. Like he always seemed to have like a slight hunch. And hey, like he just, just like... Because, just because we've been talking about feces yeah. lately on the podcast... Yeah. It, you like have to like throw Vince McMahon had shit in his trunks and then he put them on and they started creeping <laughs> and then he creeps around. 
<clears throat> oh my god! But no, he's no, he's influenced no one. Right, we will. He's influenced us to move on with our lives. Next question, Ian. Hey guys, I have a question for Dutch on the minds of the fans. What sparked the rivalry with Freddie Joe Floyd, Tracy Smothers, back in 1996 and including Savio Vega? There was supposed to be a scheduled match for SummerSlam 1996, a tag team match with Savio and Freddie against Dutch and Bradshaw. Can Dutch put everyone's mind at ease? <clears throat> Fan of the show. So is this true? I don't know. They said that they wanted to do... I think Freddie Joe, I think Tracy had just kind of got the WWE and they they wanted to do something with him and they knew that we'd been together in Memphis and we liked each other. So they wanted me to have a match with him, of course, lose, and then Bradshaw will come in. Have you ever seen that match? I don't think I have. Well, let me just – you don't have to see it. The first match – we had it. I turned my, they rang, they rang the bell, ding, 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 to start the match. And I turned around and he small packaged me one, two, three. That's it. Ah. And, and he hopped up and now uh, he's all happy in the crowd. I think we were in like somewhere in Texas on the border. I'm not on, a, on, a, on the Gulf. And the crowd goes nuts. So I get the mic, wait a minute. That ain't, that ain't fair. I wasn't ready. I, you know, you know, he cheated in this. I'll, I'll challenge you one more time. See if you can do that again. And of course, we asked the people. Oh, they they want him to get back in. We get back in this time. I go after him, throw a punch. He blocks it, hits me, hits me. Small package me again. One, two, three. The first the first pin was like four seconds. The second ten, uh, second fall was like twelve seconds. So I, I have lost two straight in less than 30 seconds. I think that's somewhat of a record, I, I would think. So, and then I said, you'll never do it again, blah, blah, blah. And then he got in. Then I started beating his ass on the third fall. And then he'd come back, come back. And then that's when uh, Bradshaw come in and we beat the shit out of him. And I think Savio makes the save. That's how it all got to where it is. We uh, and Vince, I, I heard that Vince looked at him and says, did you ask Dust to do this? He said, no, it's Dutch's idea. Oh, okay. So, and I remember Vince, you know, the topic of conversation lately, Vince, get it? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know he had such a past or he had such a, you know, future that we'd be talking about him here. But, uh, and, and Vince... He, he was commentating. So, crazy, huh? Yeah. I'm just looking. It seems to be actually around SummerSlam 96 time. So, I'm looking. Freddie Joe Floyd defeats Zebekiah in 11 seconds on WWF Superstars. In, what the hell is that worth? Yakima, Washington. Apparently, this happened. So, it might have happened. Uh, but it's probably a house show. Oh, no. Yeah, it would have been a Superstars thing. So, um no idea whether you promised or suggested you were going to be on the SummerSlam card that year. What was the main event? Vader versus Shawn Michaels. And what year was it? 93? No, no, 96. So this would have been Cleveland, Ohio, maybe? I don't know. Hey, all the insides of the arenas all look the same. But as far as being on the card, you can't remember if you were promised or not. Mark Cole, Dutch and James, I was looking at some match results and saw that Dutch wrestled young KG Muto, aka the Great Muto, in Puerto Rico in 1988, when he worked as the Super Black Ninja. Does Dutch remember this, or any other encounters with pre-Muto Muto? Thanks, as always. So that was Muto? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> do you remember him, <laughs> this, I do remember it. But I didn't know it was, you know, Muda went on to fame and I, <laughs> I stayed in my lane. But I do do kind of remember that. When you've had, I don't know, I've tried to count my matches that I've had one time. I, I can't even count them. I can't even really estimate them. I would say 4,000, maybe more. 
you know where they really doubled up on me though? Yeah. In mid south in Oklahoma. We would wrestle Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday, we would do double headers. So I would wrestle uh I don't know, 14 times a week sometimes. That's a lot. But anyway, yeah, but Muda, I I, I do remember wrestling him. Mm. Yes. And he I beat the living crap out of him. Oh, any, go ahead. any memories of him beyond this that you didn't no, even he was, notice he him? Was, he, he was good. I was trying to talk to him. He didn't speak English. So I said, okay, guess what? He went, he just looked at me like that. And I said, we're, we're just collared in the ring. I just went out there and had a match with him. Hmm. Oh, he knew, he knew some of the English, like arm drag. He knew that. Punch, he knew that. Uh, comeback, he knew that. Hip toss, slam. He knew all the terms that I would call. So we just go out there. He knew sell. So, and that's the only word he heard during the whole match is sell, sell, sell. So he saw, <laughs> no, <laughs> it was, it, it was a pretty good match. I, I remember that. Have you, have you been in <laughs> any matches? He with... said, sell. No, no, <laughs> no, sell. You sell. Yeah. I said, "Oh no, I can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm too close to yeah. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a camera here. Go ahead. Have you ever worked with somebody who <laughs> you who knew absolutely no English and there was no communication whatsoever? I probably have, but you just go out there and just whatever goes goes. You know, if a guy wanted to slam me, I'd I'd just let him slam me." Then if he drops an elbow, I'd move. Then I'd go back to him. I, I'm sure I have worked for somebody who spoke, but they got to speak some English. Because, you know, you you got to speak, like I said, the, the code word. You got to, like, punch, kick, and sell, and, you know, move. And they they got to do something. I mean, they, they can at least gather that much in. Cameron from Russia. Hey, Dutch James. Hope all is well with you from guys. From where? From Russia. KGB. We don't know that yet. He's not revealed. His, uh, he's not revealed okay. it. Uh, I okay. wanted to ask Dutch about Dwayne and his obvious gear steroids usage. This is Dwayne, Dwayne Rock Johnson. Because let's face it, no genetics will get you that big in your 50s. I can understand where Brock might be coming from with his UFC background, some possible NDA, etc. He's a professional athlete. I get it, maybe. No one believes that Rock's, Brock's clean, anyway. Uh, but why can't The Rock just fess up about it? He's an actor slash wrestler. Even Triple H didn't deny the fact that he was on fuel when he had his prime body 2002, for instance. He promotes his workout routines and stuff while claiming that he's natural, which is disingenuous and straight up deceiving towards his audience. So, this fella is saying that there's no way that The Rock can look like that clean at no. his age. No. Well, even forget his age. They still, you, you won't look like that naturally. If you do the juice, do the steroids, yeah, you can look like that. But... I forgot what were the first steroids that I ever heard of. They were the, because I tried to get some, I couldn't get any. Like but the you know pills, what? Nobody like told Dianabol or something. It was Dianabol. Yeah. Dianabol. I, I couldn't, but you know what? No, somebody, they, they never told me that you have to work out with it at the same time. Well, screw that. I just want to take some bills and, you know, just build the muscles up. But that working out, you no, know, that was just too much. So I, I quit. So I just gained a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, steroids in the rock, because, as I say, I've written a book on him somewhere. I don't know where it is. And in my research, he's only confessed to using steroids once. And he said it was in, when he was, like, college, I think for the Miami Hurricanes, and he said he tried it for a few weeks, didn't see any benefit, and then didn't bother with well, them he's ever on, again. He's, he's on it now. Got to be on the He can't not be to a point. I hate to say this, because there's two things. One, he, in the late 90s, he had surgery for gynomastia. I can't remember the thing. What is that? When you get titties. Yeah. 
and he had surgery to remove like fatty t- tissue, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, same as test, actually, <laughs> test uh, got as well. And it's a, a common side effect with people who've been on steroids, you know, too many hormones pumping through you, I guess. But also, I mean, when The Rock got absolutely huge for like the Fast and Furious films when he first started going, like, just seen the th- the veins on him. It's like he just. Mm-hmm. I just don't think you can get that big without being on something. Well, when they take the when they took the the juice when they started testing for steroids, those guys trimmed up. You know, Shawn Michaels, hell, he would look he looked like a damn eighteen year old walking around. You know, he just didn't have any more muscle definition. I mean, he could still do the stuff, but. Guys hated that, and Vince hated it too, because Vince was on it. I think Vince is on it now. Oh God, yeah. How can you look like that? Nearly eighty, and not be. Yeah, and I don't know, but that that steroid. <clears throat> you know, you go to the gym back in those days, and you got all those guys walking around like, hey. yeah. and the thing about steroids, it gives people short tempers. Like Sid Vicious, oh, man, he just go off sometimes. And I say, Vince, I mean, not Vince. I said, Sid, calm the fuck down. Hmm. Oh, damn. Oh, we got it. We got it. You're, you're on the saw, so okay. Hmm. No, I mean, and, he, and he'd laugh, laugh it off. If I did that, he'd laugh it off. But I've seen him just get so mad, just, just on the spur of the moment. Somebody could say something to him, and he'd snap. So... I had to shoot him. I, I shot him a couple of times to calm him down. Mm, I think that's but he was, he was, he was, he was so jacked that the bullet bounced off of him. So I, I left him alone do, do, after that. Do you think it's like a case of semantics? I know I'm not on steroids, but actually you're on like TRT, like testosterone replacement therapy or something else that isn't technically classed as a steroid. And that's, mm-hmm. that's how they get around it. I mean, here's another thing. Brock Lesnar, he, he, um, as they say, pissed hot in like 2016 when he did that UFC 200 return against Mark Hunt and the fact that he was under the care of WWE's wellness policy for about five years beforehand and never popped once was Mm -hmm. a bit ridiculous yes so I think with WWE's thing is it's always been the case of if you have a prescription from a doctor you can have whatever you want does that sound right well well, yeah could be but here's another thing you have this examiner come out and you go into the, the little PP room, and there's an examiner there. He's supposed to watch you do it. But you know, slip him a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, whatever. I know see nothing. I know see nothing. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that happened all the damn time. So I don't put I don't put anything beyond them or past them that they wouldn't be willing to do. Because the examiner's in there by himself. Nobody's checking on him. You give him 100 bucks, 200 bucks, that's a lot of money. Just mm-hmm. somebody hands you, just look the other way. Hey, okay? Sh- Sean Waltman admitted that um, he knew he was going to fail a test, and I think like the examiner could see the nerves in his eyes, and he said, just give me $300 or something like that, and this gets thrown out the window. So he went, I believe see it. you later. I believe it. And, uh, you on- see how cor- you see how corrupt those bastards are. Yeah, money corrupts you can get any you can- <laughs> you can get anything through, but I don't know. You grease you grease the right palm, Dutch. Yes, and, it. Uh, That's Sh- it. Shane Douglas on Franchise University with Shane Douglas also said to me in I think probably a future episode as this comes out that during his 1990 slash 1991 run with the WWF. He said, uh, you didn't actually have to go into the room to go for a whiz. You could just have a whiz and just take it in and give it them. They, yeah. they wouldn't inspect it. So Shane Douglas ended up doing doing the whittle for everybody in the locker room in 1990, 1991. And when it came time for him to like submit his test, he had nothing left to give. Really? Yeah. So what they do with him I th- I when think, he? I think he managed to squeeze something out at the end, so he never got suspended or anything. But no, he used to do the same thing. Harvey Whippleman did it for Sid. Downtown Bruno did it for Sid. So you're saying Sid was on the juice? I 
educated guess. Oh. What if somebody was on the on the juice, but you know, he just started it, he pissed for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Said, I'm clean, I'm clean, and the whole group comes back hot. So one time the Iron Sheik says, uh I think Vince or somebody said to him, Shake, you tested positive. He said, Oh, positive. Oh, they're good, good. He said, No, it's positive. He went, No, positive, good, negative. He said, No, you don't understand, you dumb bastard. Fuck, you tested positive for steroids. Oh, no, no, can't be true. No, no, lie, lie. <laughs> he was just going on. God, I know, chic of all people. Um, how many, in your opinion, how many, in your opinion, obvious steroid users would absolutely deny it to the hilt? And how many were open with it? Most of them would most deny open, it. Most of, oh, mo- most would deny? Yes. Okay. Most of them would deny it. And I don't know why. They just, I don't think anybody, hey, are you on the juice? No, they'd say no. Man, it's according to who you were, too, I guess. I don't know. But I'm, I never ask anybody that. Because I'm afraid if they were on the juice, they'd get up and beat the crap out of me. Right. They snap. <laughs> God damn it, you mother. Mm. <laughs> so I, I didn't ask them. Are we, uh, are we saying then, so uh, just to wrap this up, is The Rock on the juice in some form or not? Oh, I think he's on the juice. He's been on the juice. So he knew this was coming for what? A year ago, all this. Well, maybe not a year because I think that since Endeavor started, what, six months, seven months, or whatever it was, I think he's been preparing. We, and we, he, he, is, he is cut up, too, and he looks good. Yeah. We'll move on. Salvatore M says, Dutch, very little is said about Whitey Caldwell, aside from the fact that he was almost a Bobby Eaton-level nice guy in the Smoky Mountains. Can you give us any insights on this esoteric legend? Never met Whitey Caldwell, but I heard a lot about him. It was a very, he was from East Tennessee. It never really traveled from there. I think he was from Knoxville or Johnson City or, and I don't even know how he got in wrestling, but he was over big time in East Tennessee. They drew some big houses with the guy. And he was, he wasn't even a big guy. He probably weighed 170 pounds, no more than 180. But he would go in there, and he was so good and so believable. People believed the guy. You know, when I talk about connectivity to the fans, he connected to them because he was them. He was one of them. And when he'd get in the ring, of course, they'd always try to mismatch him with some big guy that looked like he didn't have a chance with. And they just loved him to death. I heard stories about him. I think he died in a car crash before I got to East Tennessee, I think, and I and I never met the guy, but he he drew some big big houses there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Corwell was killed in a car accident when a man was driving at high speed and was trying to pass cars when he hit Corwell's in a curve. Uh, this what? was in 1972, October 7th. Oh yeah, yeah, long time before I got there. Yeah, uh, I, was well, trying, no, I was trying. I was trying to think. So uh, not, this is the Ron Wright era. Years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the Wright brothers, they were over too. So you got these, what you had, they all had Southern accents. If you talk to Ron Wright or Don Wright, you think he was down in South Alabama somewhere. And they said, well, let me tell you something here, boy. And, they do, and that's the way they do their interviews. So, and he got over and... You know, when they would have people come out and they finally turn baby face, they would have some northern heel and come out and tell them they were a bunch of damn fake ass rednecks or whatever. Oh. And then, of course, Don and Ron was the, the big star of the group. Don and I mean, Ron was the big brother. Don was a, the, the lesser brother. But they would come out and they would defend East Tennessee and they were big heroes. I mean, I don't know what to – it was just punch and kick is all it was. They didn't really try to hurt their trade, but actually trying to do some wrestling. Mm-hmm. Hell, that'd kill them. 
They didn't know how to wrestle, but they knew how to get over and they knew how to connect with that crowd. And they were one of them, and that's all they needed. There was, uh, best I can tell, one match on YouTube film of Ron Wright versus Whitey Corwell from October 1962 in the Kingsport Territory. Yep. Uh, Follow-up question with a t- uh, twist. Uh, what is your Mount Rushmore of wrestlers who weren't just nice, but nice to the point that they could be appointed saints? Pure, virtuous saints. The twist. Bobby Eaton and Kerry Von Erich cannot be on this list. So the four nicest guys, apart from Bobby Eaton, essentially. The four nicest guys. Can't say yourself. Okay, I'll, I'll put you one on right now. Cool. What about Brad Armstrong? Mm-hmm. Very nice guy. Here's another one that a lot of people won't know, but Ted Allen. He was one of the nightmares. So nice guy. I'm I'm trying to think. It's hard to pick up the Saints in wrestling. Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody always would have a vice. Like, I guess this this involves no drinking and no carousing and no damn playing Shitting. around with <laughs> you know, beating girls up and you know, raping them and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they, there's probably a few more. What if I put Jerry Lawler on that? No? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of some in Memphis. I really can't. I really can't. What would you say, like one. Dream Machine or someone? Yeah, Dream Machine had some vices. Because ah. he was a. Uh, he, he was a. Uh, he used a. He was a pill taker. So, and he so was, without vice then? Uh. You know, Dream Machine, he did that gimmick so good. Dusty saw him and wanted to take him to Florida and work an angle with him. And he said, no, I can't leave Memphis. And he didn't want to leave Memphis, so he didn't leave. And I went back over there one time, and I was on a show, some independent show. And Dream, he came by. He wasn't on the show, but he came by and... He was a he was a nice guy. He re- he really was. Except he just had those vices, and uh, I talked to him, and he told me that he was he didn't have a job, didn't have any money coming in, and I remember I ended up giving him like fifty bucks because he was hungry and he was kind of dirty, and I felt sorry for him. I really did. I spent the night with him one time when he was when he was still working. And I woke wake up, it's like four o'clock in the morning. And I look over at him and he's this is weird. I should have left the room. He wasn't doing nothing like, you know, doing anything with bodily fluids. Well, he was really. He was bleeding over there in in the bed because he had He had gotten blood the night before, and he had hit it, and it was just pouring down his face. I went, what the fuck are you doing, psycho? Nothing, man. (laughs) And I got up, and I turned all the lights on, looked around. I said, are you fucking okay? He actually scared me when he did that. So finally, I said, go clean yourself up. Hell, go to bed. Go to sleep. And he went in there and he, he cleaned seven and then come and he laid down. But I'm laying there now, the, you know, just the bathroom mm-hmm. light on, but I'm not this. I kept looking <laughs> like, hell, he could get up and do something again. That's the last time I stayed with him one time, but I actually stayed with him twice that night, the first time and the last time. <laughs> so, but I, I, I love dream. He had a hell of an interview. You ever listen to him? Yeah, yeah. I think we watched him on the show some time ago, yeah. Yeah. He say, I forgot, lightning bolt or something about his daddy or something and something. Mm. But he he had a good rhyme. He was like the first one who like rapped a little bit. Mm. It was like a semi-rap. But he was over. He got over with the people. People They liked him. I've got a name for you. What Dave is Dave Brown. Dave Brown, he would put that. 
McFoley, maybe. I, I'm wanting to say yes, but I, he didn't drink. He didn't take drugs. Hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, he could. Anyone else? He'd probably could? fit in. Well, if I really went down a list, I could tell you, but Dream Machine wouldn't be on there. Let me say that. <laughs> Great guy, but and and Dave Brown is a very very, uh, you know I talked to him. I wanted to come on the podcast, but he said, "Who's that guy you do it with?" I said, "James." Mm. And he went, "Oh no, the British guy." Yeah. I went, "Yeah, he's, yeah, he's going to no. show you up." Yeah, and then he I says, know. "Not no, but hell no." Oh, he doesn't like you, man. No, no he just doesn't want me to show him. No, up. he said he does. He doesn't do podcasts. That's what no. he said. No, oh, you kidding? No, he, that's what he said. Yeah, he called me a liar. Yeah. Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> no, he's I still a good want to guy. He really is. Yeah. Hey, here's another one. Go on. Bob, Bob Cottle. Huh? Yeah. Good guy. What if I said Cornette? No. You wouldn't believe it. Here's your list. No. no. Well, I, I named four in the rest of it. No, that's, that's good but, enough. Two of them were announcers. Uh, I, I hate to say this. We, I don't have a clip teed up. I forgot to send you a clip beforehand. Kevin B. asked, there used to be an animated series called The Passion of the Ass. It was about Vince McMahon's ass. No lie, it was buried on YouTube. But you can find it if you search around. There are two episodes that have been uploaded on other sites. Right. That is going to have to wait till next week. But don't let me forget that because... I've what is it? The Ballad of the Ass. The, the, the Passion of... And it's a cartoon. Okay, not only was it a cartoon voiced by Vince McMahon, purely based around his own posterior and the adventures of Vince McMahon's ass. The worst thing was it it was an entirely ripped off concept of some like adult swim cartoon that had been out the same year, like Assy McGee, I think it was called. And it was just as yeah. stupid. And then someone at WWE ripped it off and gave it to Vince. And then they could they made an entire series of these cartoons that they could never air because they were successfully sued for uh, intellectual infringement of the highest order because it was the most obvious rip-off in the entire so world. So if we had one, we couldn't play it. Yeah, we could. But I'm going to save it for next week. We'll try and figure something out, and I'll try and... Uh, Hell, I want to see it now. Oh, go. Cool. I'm going to tune it. I'm going to tune in next week just so I can see it. Yeah. All right, then. I'll send you a clip, and then you can review it. Next question. Nick says, Dutch, have you ever worked with the Patriots before? Any stories about him? Thanks. Del Wilkes, uh, I think. Del Wilkes. I, I did work with him. Good guy. He played football for the University of South Carolina. He talked about that a little bit. But I think he should have been more successful than what he was. He had a great look. Under the hood, I didn't like the Patriot gimmick that much. Why not? I just didn't. It was too hokey uh, or too regional. Well, I think. It, well, I think he should have took. Well, it's. I just didn't like it. I didn't think there was any money in it. Now, if you'd have gave him another name and another look, I think he would have. He would have done something, but. I'm trying to remember. He was on a, a show with me one time. I got to tell some of these people, you know, some of these independent shows you make, because I was living in Nashville, and this show was in, I even forgot where it was, up north, either in Kentucky or Indiana or somewhere. And I went up, and, and it was uh, like a little convention and a, sh a show that night. It was in a school. So we went in, and I, I guess they had like 10 vendors there, but it was just guys who were working the show. So <laughs> we could have put this, we could have put the same stuff up during the show and not had to been been there early. So went in there, and oh, uh, Ole Anderson was there. I'm trying to remember. Uh, one man gang was there. I think Barry Horowitz was there. Uh, Arn Anderson was there, and a few more. But I forgot. You know, I asked for a 
he told me what I would go there for. So I give him a prize and I said, I, I got to have half of it up front. Good thing I asked him that because that night the house was the horrible. As we say in the wrestling business, the shits. No, it wasn't that good. So it come time for him to start paying the guys and no money came. But see, I already had half my money, so plus I'd sold some gimmicks. So I had, I had, I actually had, I had had a pretty good day, but he only gave me half my money. So I remember I walked in and they had the guy, uh, it was Arn and Gang and somebody else. They had him jacked up on the wall like this. They, they grabbed him here and yanked him up. We want our money, blah, 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 blah. And what, what he'd done, he, he thought the house was going to pay it, but there was nobody there. He didn't have the money. And they were going to beat the crap out of him. They called the police and everything. So finally it got worked out that he was he's going to mail the money. We had no choice. Mail the money. Paul Orndorff, I mean, not, yeah, Orndorff was there. I remember that. And we had to go down to the police station. It was a mess. But, and we filed a suit and he, and they got a lawyer. He, he paid the money. He had to, because hmm. he was ordered to, but they were going to beat the shit out of this guy. And Patriot was one of and them. And I don't know. He was. Patriot was one of them. He had him jacked up too. Sure hmm. did. And he was mad. And Arn was mad. I forgot where they'd come from. I think Arn was working for WWE at the time. And I think he, he was living in, I think he was still living in Charlotte. And I don't know how, I, I know he didn't drive over there. That's too far. He probably flew over and probably them. Uh, the Patriot did too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too far for me. So, but they didn't, they didn't get uh, half their money before they went. They was depending on get their money then. But and he didn't run any more shows. He, he didn't. So that, that's good. The Patriots are a funny one because, as you said, he probably should have been a bigger star than he was because it seems like for the most of his career, he was a tag team guy, even though, you know, he was like 6'4 and a great body. And... I, don't, well, I don't know if he's that tall, but he, was a, he, he looked great. Yeah, he, was a big... he, he really did. Who, who did he team with? Buff or was Backwell it the for... Patriots? No, no, no. He teamed with Buff Bagwell for a while in WCW in the early 90s. I think he was called mm -hmm. the Trooper in the AWA. And Anyway, mm -hmm. he ends up in the WWF for his big shot, and he makes it three months before he tears his triceps and then retires. And I wanted to ask you this. Have you ever heard of Tom Brandy, who had, mm -hmm. had done the Patriot gimmick on the independent scene for years after Del Wilkes had retired? And he'd always claimed that he had bought the gimmick rights from Del. And then Dell came out years later and said, no, he didn't. I never sold the rights to the gimmick to anybody. But he was apparently so deep in drug addiction at the time, he'd never noticed. And at some point in the future, apparently Honky Tonk Man had bought the rights to the Patriot gimmick. And he may even still have them for all I know. Honky Tonk Man. Apparently so. Didn't know he was Honky an investor Tonk Man ain't Honky Tonk Man ain't buying breakfast from waffle house he can get out of it that's the tightest guy i've ever seen one of them tight guy so he would he would i don't think he'd do it and he wouldn't why would he buy the 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 gimmick of the patriot he was honky tonk man honky tonk man a lot more over than damn patriot guy well maybe he was going to do some independence and he wanted to put the patriot character on somebody he was working with so he was like taking a second around with him all the time, and mm -hmm. that's why he ended up, quote unquote, buying the. I don't character. think you can. How could you copyright the Patriot? It's a it's a name. It's in common usage. I don't know. I guess you could. I guess you could do it. But like we the people, I was selling some we the people shirts one time. Somebody said you can't do that. So why? Well, WWE owns it. I said, no, they don't own We the People. We the People's in the Constitution. It's in the it's in the common 
uh, up mm. domain that mm. uh, the public domain you can use it it's quite big the writing at the top as well isn't it we the people yeah it could be it could be any font or size you want it to be but it you you can't you can't take that that's that belongs to everybody wouldn't you think i suspect so i'm trying to actually find it um u.s constitution Yes, we the people. It's the biggest lettering at the very top. Right, yeah. I'm going to ask a few more questions and we'll shut this down. Darren from Newcastle, England. Hello, Dutch and James. Big fan of yours. In your opinion, or if you know for a fact who made WWE more money, who made more money in WWE? Uh, uh, yep, yeah, specifically WWE. Stone Cold Steve Austin or Hulk Hogan? What do you think? And why? Show your Different eras. Out. Different eras. Different ticket prices. So... How long was Stone Cold? How long did the Stone Cold era last? Okay, so Steve Austin, the very end of '95, when he became Stone Cold and started becoming. I'll tell you what, the Austin 316 t shirts came out the middle of 1996. He started becoming a main, a Stone Cold main eventer, as it were, by about mid '97. And he worked until 2003. Then he had a year as a commissioner sort of thing, as the sort of like a lead character on Raw. And then that's more or less it. I mean, they keep releasing T-shirts of his. But, uh, you know, for, for merchandise, there's no question Austin sold the most. It's hard to say. I would say if, they, if, if they're still selling T-shirts, I think he's within the top four even today. Yes? Yeah, I think so. I would say probably, and even though Hulk's reign was longer, that's hard to say. I want to say Austin, then I want to say, well, hell, you, Hogan was hot, hot, hot. So if if you're gonna say hard to hard to say if you're gonna say in all promotions, I think with Hogan's WCW run that would easily put him at top because he was making in WCW he was probably making six seven million a year on a, on ostensibly a part time contract from ninety four to two thousand he was making crazy money. Austin's run was in theory hotter, but uh, it was shorter as well. But he made. He was making probably ten million a year just on on merchandise, Austin, at his peak. And Hulk Hogan couldn't touch that. But Hogan was doing, let's say, in the hot run, end of eighty three to middle of ninety three. Then he came back in two thousand two, and then he did some brief runs, two thousand five, two thousand six, which will have definitely got seven. Then he did pay that payoffs. Then he did that tape with Bubba the Love Sponge's wife. Yeah, and then he didn't. He didn't get a one penny royalty out of that. What he and, didn't? No, I'd sue him. And that was out. Get, of, that was out of WWE's get remit, the, anyway. Oh, I'd get the lawyer that that Grant woman's got. I'd sue the hell out of him. Yeah. Okay, so everything I've said there, Austin or Hogan, purely WWE. Who drew? Who you say was making ten million a year? Hogan, Austin for merch, plus payoffs. Oh. I'll go with Austin. Okay, then fine. We. I will... wish she'd pay me that fifty dollars he owes me. Why don't you get him on the... I think he'd do the show, if you asked him. I'll call him. Yeah, do it. My God, he owes me anyway. Yeah. I gave him the name. I didn't give him the Stone Cold. I gave him the Austin. You've heard that story, right? Oh, yeah. You're a big fan of um, the Million Dollar Man. Or were you? Uh, um, no, not really. No, the Six Million Dollar Man, not Ted DiBiase. Is what I meant. No, not, not really. I, I know what it's about. Get Steve Austin on. Right, I'm going to ask you probably two. Three, if it's a short answer. G-Man says, given the two deeply disturbing reports about McMahon that were published in the Wall Street Journal and alleged atrocities cited in the Janelle Grant complaint, are you more inclined to believe that Vince McMahon played a significant role in preventing Superfly Jimmy Snooker from being charged in the death of Nancy Argentino? I've always heard that. Made a call to McMahon. Got it calmed down. But I don't even know what happened in that room. I just know a, a woman died. And was she thrown through the window? No, she was 
what happened. Believe I remember to have um, been pushed over in the bedroom they were sharing, and then she must have got like a brain bleed, a brain bleed aneurysm, died. Uh, the the accusation is that Vince McMahon had either gone to like talk to a police chief or actually walked into the police station with a big bag of money and money was exchanged and then Jimmy Snooker was taken out and the police basically dropped the case on him. Well, I don't know about walking into the police station with a big bag of money. That seems a little bit much. That could have... He could have probably got him out of the police station that night and then do some negotiating back and forth. I don't think he was... I don't know how that worked, but I do think that Vince played a role in getting Mr. Snuka off because what was this woman's name? Nancy got Argentina. There? Yep. And he was in a hotel or she was in a hotel. Did they check in together or no? I forgot. I th yeah, they were in a relationship at the time. I think Jimmy okay, Snuka was I, well, married as well at this point. But Well, yeah, I do. I do think... Hey, money talks. We all know that. Money talks. And what's they saying? Bullshit? Bullshit walks. Mm. But I think if they made an offer to the police, I think it was, or to the DA, I think it was accepted and they didn't bring any charges. Because if she just had a brain bleed and they couldn't tell how they got it, she could have she could have fallen. She could have got drunk and fell down if she was drinking at all. And it, it didn't you gotta go by the evidence. Did he hit her? Did he push her? There's no way there's no way to prove that he pushed her. No, well, uh, Jimmy's initial defense was that she'd gone out to take a, a whiz like on a drive and she fell over and smacked her head on a rock and then later he kept changing his excuse essentially uh, when, where, was she, where was she found in the room I think so yeah she was uh, so, uh, Snooker was the only suspect involved in the subsequent investigation if you bear with me one second I'll just try and find where it is um, so uh, emergency personnel arrived at the room at the George Washington Motor Lodge. They found that Jimmy Snooker's girlfriend, Nancy Argentina, had been injured. She was transported to a medical centre where she died shortly after, after an undetermined craniocerebral injury. The coroner's report stated that Argentino, 23, died of traumatic brain injuries consistent with a moving head striking a stationary object. Autopsy findings show Argentino had more than two dozen cuts and bruises, possible sign of serious domestic abuse all over a body. And mm. well, that changes it a little bit. Yes, yeah, Snooker had uh, Snooker had uh, previous for this kind of thing, and I think other people had said that they'd seen him hit her before. Well, they just didn't want to. They had to had they they had to have had some type of motive or financial reward to not pursue it. They might have been Vince, fans. Someone might have been a fan in the office. You never know. In the police in the police station. And said, no, not Jimmy. He's beloved. No, I, I, I think it's more like some money changed hands. When did you first I don't think it, I don't think it. Right after it happened. No, no. The, her death right after it happened. But I heard the rumor couple of weeks later. Right. So I was going to ask, this isn't like a like an internet room you heard years later. You heard this at the time. No, I heard that, you know, he just it, it was all it was also implied that Vince he used his influence or his money to get Snuka out of it. Interesting. Snuka, I think, drank a lot. Did a, a lot of the I, old Probably no, lots of it. Yeah. So they they could have been really sky high, and who knows what hap what happened? I don't, but I do suspect a little foul play. But you have to prove it. You're innocent until proven guilty. Robert Young, 
Hey guys, love the show. I consider it the number one show on YouTube. Very good, thank you for that. Really, very um, good. First question. Did, do, um, no, actually, I, I, I'm going to leave that one for another time. Second question: Would you, either one of you know who would own the CWA Memphis Library tapes from the late '70s and early '80s? Thanks for all the knowledge about wrestling, and James, thanks for the WSI show. Thank you. So, who owns the classic no, Memphis tapes? Nobody knows who owns them. Who claims to own them or have a stake? Several, several people. Uh, in one of my books, I write the story about some, the Ballad of Memphis or something. And Memphis was sold to this guy named Larry. I can't remember it's his like last Bertram name. It's like Bertram or Burton. It, it switches. Larry Burton. But, and Burton found some marks up there around columbus ohio or somewhere in ohio and they were supposed to have paid like a million dollars for the territory and the guy and burton said i'll run it and they just didn't do any due diligence on it territory was only sad the only thing they had that was worth anything was channel five in memphis and some more stations that's all they had and then, then they had a big to do and the investors bought it or thought they bought it. And, but, but I think the ownership now, <clears throat> they voided the sale. So nobody can really determine an owner. It's not Lawler. It's not Jared. It's not Larry Burton. It's not the investors who, invested money in it they just didn't do it so it's it's indeterminate who owns the uh the memphis footage i think who's claimed um jerry lawler probably has a claim somewhere jerry jarrett probably has a claim somewhere jeff jarrett yep. probably has a claim somewhere i don't uh, think jeff does well now that jerry's gone maybe jeff does in that well, sense. maybe um maybe. Larry Burton slash Bertram slash whatever his real name is. What about what about Corey Macklin? Didn't he claim that he had the rights at one point? <laughs> I don't know, but it was it was. You know, we ought to be able to use Memphis footage after Ying Yang, because who owns it? Somebody says you can't you can't use that because uh, I own it. Well, when we say prove it. And they can't prove it. So we just continue to. Some of that old Memphis stuff is still pretty good. Mm. It's entertaining. And I wonder, uh, that thing, when they wanted to call me to testify, I said, testify to what? I said, don't, don't get me involved in this. I don't have nothing. I didn't make a dime off of it. Didn't put a dime in it. So don't ask me to testify unless you're willing to pay me for my time. And they didn't want to do that. I said, well, I may not be able to be, be found either when you get ready for mm. take this to court. I, I won't be there, so don't count on me. Is, is it the same for the later libraries, like the USWA stuff? Is it just, is oh, it just the same? I say no one knows who owns it. No, it's all together, really. Mm. USWA. CWA is what? Memphis, uh, con yeah, that that's that's Memphis. Well, USWA is Memphis, aside from the bit that was. And what is CWA? Dallas. What is CWA stand for? Continental Wrestling Association. Continental Continental was in uh, Pensacola. Okay, hang on. Right, Memphis Wrestling CWA. It stands for something, but I think there's yeah, Continental Wrestling Association was Jerry Jerry. There's just more than one CWA. It's really confusing. Okay, it is confusing. It's like there's more. There's, there was more than one USWA because well, Dallas I, changed I, the name to USWA first. I do know that Jerry Jarrett probably got around one hundred eighty thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars allegedly for his part. I think Lawler got, I don't know, a million maybe, five hundred thousand. But then it, they found out that n there was no way to make any money. Their money just went to 
to the Hawksters, to Burton. You know, Burton's they don't know they don't know his real name. No. They still don't know his real name. And I don't even know if he's still alive. To tell you the truth. He called me one day. I I I'll say my relationship with Larry Burton was very toxic. Because he co called me up one day and he says, and this is the way he talked, Dutch. I need you. I need you in Memphis Saturday. I said, I'm not going to Memphis Saturday. Yeah, you are. I said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. God damn it. You're going to. I said, I'm not going to Memphis, mother mm -hmm. effer. God damn. Then he started cussing me. I started cussing him. I've never cussed a man. And he, I don't know if he's cussed a man like that or not. And we would cuss each other face to face. I've never been in more cuss fights that should have led to a physical fight in my life of what I would say to Larry Burton. He was, you know, you don't like him right off the bat. So you want to punch the shit out of him, which I should have done. But anyway, uh, maybe I, I shouldn't have done it. But he he talked like he, he knew the mafia. He knew this. He knew that. and uh, So he called me up one day. He said, you, you are you going to go? I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to Puerto Rico. I'll find you. I said, you won't find me in Puerto Rico. Yes, I will. I said, they can't find the governor half the time. Mm. So how are you going to find me? Screw you. I ain't doing it. So he had a, he had a little friend named Dave and he didn't want to, I had something he wanted. I forgot what it was. I know what it was. It was a belt. A, a belt. Yeah, he wanted it, right. And I says, well, okay, get, pay me the money you owe me, and I'll give you the belt, you know? And he, I don't know you no money. I said, bullshit, you owe me two grand or $1,800 or whatever it was. No, I don't. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you you give me that amount of money, I'll give you the belt. He said, why don't we do this? Yeah, why don't we do this? I'll send Dave over there, and you give him a belt, and I'll write you a check. I said, get the... Fuck out of here. Yeah. You're already trying to screw me out of money and now just give the belt over. No, I'm not doing it. So, and we cussed each other a little more and then mm. call ended this last time I talked to him. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking, Lawler, I asked him one time, where did you find this? Where did this guy find you or you find him? But what it was, the guy started hanging around the, he went to see Lawler at the matches, I think, at WWE, and started talking to him there. Or USWA. Or, or maybe WWE. No, no, no. No, he, was, he went to WWE to talk to him. Oh, okay. And he convinced him to do this deal, I guess, whatever it was. Said he could sell it. And then he says, give him a, a year with it. We can buy it back for 10% of what we paid for it. And then... It's like you just take a vacation with a big payday. Except it didn't last after they took it over. It lasted about another month, and it was done. Mm. Because, see, they didn't get really paid for the TV in Memphis. How the TVs used to work in the wrestling business was a little territory. As they would put their tape on a station, and sometimes they would have to pay because it was like a... Uh, infomercial. What is it? An infomercial, right. Sometimes it was that. And Memphis actually had the best deal because they actually split the revenue. So if you have something, you know, Memphis had huge ratings. Sometimes they'd have maybe 300,000 or more people watching the show. They had the primetime rating. See, that show could have been on it Eight o'clock at night, and he'd draw the same thing. So, and you get it at eleven o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. I'm going to finish on this story from Mike Johnson, 2010. Jerry Lawler told WMC TV in Memphis, Tennessee, that his lawsuit against former Memphis wrestling commentator and announcer Corey Macklin stems from Macklin having sold the Memphis Wrestling Library to HighSpots.com whom Lawler yep. did not name, without Lawler's involvement or Lawler having relinquished his rights to the trademark on the library. So, essentially, Corey Macklin, who had absolutely no claim to this, sold 20 DVDs worth of footage to highspots.com for $20,000. 
And then, mm-hmm. before they could sue him to get the money back, he ended up dying in a car wreck. Corey Macklin did? I think so, yeah. I didn't know even know he was dead. Oh, I, I'm sorry. He died in 2013. Sorry, he was killed in a car crash in Mississippi. Okay. So I may have heard about that. Yeah, there you go. All right, we're going to shut the podcast down because we're getting over what? now. Not over with the people, just over our time and everything. <laughs> I'm getting really hungry. <laughs> anyway, thank you, very everybody, for watching, and we'll catch you again on Friday. As I say once again, ask Dutch anything. You can email questions for Dutch at gmail.com if you want your question considered for a future episode and for all the sign stuff we were talking about before, Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. But for now, thank you very much. We'll see you on Friday. And Dutch, we the people. We the people.